I want to ask you to join me in prayer today for our children, for our students, for our young adults. Uh, Most of my responsibilities at the church here up to this point has been with those, those young people and students. And I'm here to tell you that there is a war being raged for their hearts and souls and minds. I've met with multiple individuals just since the beginning of the year who are dealing with significant stress and anxiety and I'm tired of seeing it. I'm thankful that the Lord has asked me to stand in a place where I can, I can help them. But I want to see life and life abundant emerge from our students, our children, and our young people. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. So if you would, I want to ask you to stand, and we're going to go before the Lord, and we're going to lift, uh, lift up our next generation of leaders. Amen. Let's do it. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you with great thanksgiving and praise, Father, Lord, as you direct us to in your word. Lord, I thank you for each and every individual represented in this place and online around the country and around the world who are joining together, Father, of one heart, of one mind, of one accord, to give you honor and glory and praise and to be sharpened and edified by your word. Lord, I partner with these individuals now, and I lift up our children. I lift up our students. I lift up our young people, Father. Lord, watch over them, protect them, and keep them safe. May the lies, may the schemes, may the pitfall of Satan, Lord, be rendered useless in Jesus' name, Father. Lord, we pray for salvation of their mind, Father. Lord, we pray protection against (laughs) schemes and and traps and snares fall. May they fall null and void in Jesus' name. Lord, may we see young people rise up and take their places as leaders of their peers and leaders of their classmates and leaders of their teammates. Lord, leaders in their homes, Father, because they know the truth of your word. Lord, may they be sharpened. May they be edified, Father, by your word. Lord, you love children throughout scripture. You tell us of your great love and compassion you have for them. Lord, open our eyes and our ears. May we stand alongside the young people as they, as they continue through this life, Father. May we be beacons of hope and encouragement. May we speak life and truth into them, Father. Lord, so they might walk in courage and boldness for your name's sake. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. You may take a seat. If you know a young person, a student, if you have small children, take a moment tonight when you get home just to love on them, to bless them, to spend some time with them. It makes a difference. It truly does. Uh, I now have the great honor and privilege to introduce to you our special guest this evening. Uh, Pastor Robert J. Morgan is here with us. Many of you are familiar with him. He's been with us before. He's a friend of the church. He's a teaching pastor at Donaldson Fellowship just up the road in Nashville. It's good to know we have friends in Nashville. Uh, He is an author. He's written over 35 books. He has about 5 million copies in circulation, multiple languages. (laughs) It's amazing. My hands just hurt thinking about all the writing and typing that you're doing, but thank you for using your gifts and talents. Uh, He's been serving that community for over 40 years. He's leaving an amazing legacy. His latest book, 100 Verses That Made America, I hope you're familiar with it. He's he's come and he's shared a little bit of that with us previously, but if you're not familiar, I encourage you to go get a copy, familiarize yourself with it. But without further ado, please join me in welcoming our special guest, Robert J. Morgan. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you, my friends. It's been such a gloomy day that I've been looking forward all day long to the sunshine of being with you. And I feel like Minnie Pearl, who used to say, I'm so proud to be here. You know, I don't always get invited back. And I appreciate Pastor Jackson inviting me and all of you coming through this fog and mist and drizzle and rain to be here. What a joy it is. And for those watching online, then I welcome you as well. I mentioned uh, Minnie Pearl. She was a wonderful Christian woman. Her real name was Sarah Cannon. And some of you may have known her when I moved to Nashville you would run into her a great deal at the restaurants and things, and she was a famous comedian with the Grand Ole Opry. And she was, um, in her real life, she had a wonderful husband and and family, but her persona 
of many pearl was this character who never seemed to be able to find a man in her life. And she once said, I do not want any men to be my pallbearers when I die. She said, if they didn't take me out when I was alive, I don't want them to take me out when I'm dead. <laughs> she said, I had a chance once to marry a feller with $50,000, but I couldn't come up with the $50,000. And on another occasion, she said, once I swallowed a silver dollar and I had to go to the hospital and have an x-ray and I fell in love with the x-ray technician. He's the only man who ever saw anything in me. <laughs> well, it's that last statement that I want to talk about. There are so many people who feel like nobody sees anything in them. And so they go through life feeling low and sad about themselves. And that's a very hard way to live. All of my adult life, people have been talking about self-image and self-esteem. I don't know that we're talking about it quite as much now because so many other issues has pushed that subject out of the way. But people need to have a strong sense of self-confidence and self-esteem. And most psychologists believe that we base our self-image on what we think the authority figures in our lives believe about us. What does my dad think of me? That has a lot to do with our self-image. What does my mom think of me? What about my teachers? What about my coach? We've just been praying for our young people who are facing all of these issues right now, and many of them don't have anybody to believe in them. And a lot of us have struggled in life because we felt that our father, our mother, our teacher, our coach, our authority figures did not value us. And so we've had a hard time valuing ourselves. But the real basis for a healthy self-esteem, a sense of confidence, is what does my God think about me? What does the Lord think? When he thinks of me, what does he think? What's his opinion of me? And there is one passage in the Bible that gives us that answer so wonderfully, we can even title the chapter by it, and that is Psalm 139. And I'd like to invite you to turn with me to the very middle of the Bible, to Psalm 139. And you could put this title over the psalm, over, you can just with a pencil, I did it in my Bible. That's the subject of this chapter, 139, 139 of the book of Psalms, what God thinks of me. And that's one of the reasons this chapter has been so loved for so many years. Now, there's a couple of things I want to say about this psalm. First of all, it is about the greatness of God, and we're going to deal here in this chapter with some of his qualities or attributes, as we call them. But the other thing is, it's also about how the greatness of God intersects with us. And as a result of that, it's very personal. Psalm 139 is about how powerful God is and about how personal God is. And the fact that our powerful God is very personal and our personal God is very powerful and the one who knows you the best loves you the most. That's Psalm 139. The one who knows you the best loves you the most. And you'll notice there's only 24 verses in this psalm, and yet there are 48 times when the pronouns I, me, and my occur, and another 28 times when you and your occurs. So this is a very poignant psalm. It deals with the attributes or the qualities of God, but it also shows how they interrelate. They come down and lay themselves across us, and your God thinks the world of you. And you can base your self-image, your self-confidence, and your self-esteem in life, regardless of what anybody else in your life may have said or done, you can base it on what God says in this psalm. So there are 24 verses here, and it's a very clear division. There are four different stanzas, just like a very good hymn, 
four different stanzas of six verses each. And the first stanza has to do with God and his omniscience. Now, the word omniscience, I'm going to use the omni phrases some tonight. O-M-N-I, omni, is a word that means all. And science is the word that originally meant knowledge. So when we talk about the omniscience or the omniscience of God, we're talking about his total knowledge. So read with me or follow along as I read verses 1 through 6 as we begin this study. Psalm 139, beginning with verse 1. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Now, I began studying this psalm. And I became so intrigued with it, I decided to memorize it. I'm working on memorizing it in the Living Bible. And in the Living Bible, it says, Oh, Lord, you have searched me. You have examined my life, and you know me. You know everything about me. You know when I sit or stand, when far away, you know my every thought. You chart the path ahead of me and tell me where to stop and rest. You know every word before I speak it. It just has to do with God's knowledge. And this psalm, as I've sought to memorize it, and I'm just down to about verse 8 or 9 in my effort, but it's become so meaningful that I've developed a whole series of messages on it that I'm using for my podcast. I do a weekly Bible study podcast, and I'd love for you to find it wherever you find your podcast. It's just called the Robert J. Morgan Podcast. But I'm calling this series from Psalm 139, More Than Wonderful because that's the way God is to us, and his knowledge is where the psalmist begins. He says, O Lord, you have searched me. And the word searched here was the Hebrew word that they used for spies who would go and search out a city. In other words, the psalmist said, Lord, you know everything about me. You have investigated me. God has investigated you, and he knows everything about you. He says, you know when I sit and when I rise. The Lord notices whenever you stand up, whenever you sit down. Sometimes we don't even notice that. I had somebody at my home today for coffee, and while we were talking, I just sort of absently got up and got a spoon and brought it back for them, and I didn't pay any attention to it. And sometimes we're almost unconscious of our movements, but God notices everyone. Nothing is missed by him. But there is more to this phrase. Look at this again at verse 2. You know when I sit and when I rise. This is a literary technique known as a merism. M-E-R-I-S-M. And a merism is when you take two contrasting features to represent the whole. For example, the other day, well, it's been a couple of weeks ago, I lost my credit card. I never have found it. I finally had to have them send me a new one. But I searched for it high and low. Now, the phrase searching high and low is a merism. It doesn't mean that I just searched way up high and way down low. I searched everywhere in between. When you say, when you get married, that you're going to be committed for better or worse and uh, sickness and health, uh, for richer, for poorer. It doesn't mean that if you end up as a middle-class person with some money but not a lot that you don't have to love anymore. It means that everything and the continuum between those is included. So that's the figure of speech that's being used here. When the psalmist said, you know, when I sit and when I rise, he is saying, you know, everything that I do from the moment I get up until the time I go to bed, you don't miss anything. Now, the whole subject of the omniscience of God is so amazing to me. I can't, well, of course, we cannot comprehend it. It's beyond comprehension. But Almighty God knows everything, and He knows everything both in the physical and in the spiritual realm. 
He knows everything in the seen world and in the unseen world. He knows everything that ever has occurred. He knows what is happening now in every location of the entire universe. He knows the temperature of every particle of the furthest stars. And he knows what's going to happen in the future. And he even knows contingencies. So if we were to do this instead of that, he knows what the effect would be. We know that from scriptures that we can study. And he also knows it totally, eternally, intuitively, and forever. And how that can be, we don't know. It just is the nature of God. He knows these things. And I listened to William Lane Craig the other day, and he said something very interesting. He said that if God could create or would create a super angel or a supercomputer or something in which he could convey to it everything that he knew so that that angel or that computer would also be omniscient, it still would not reach the omniscience of God because it would have to be inputted. And God intuitively knows it all without ever having to learn it. God has never learned anything. Because if he learned something, it means there was some deficiency in his knowledge, and there never has been. God knows everything, and he knows everything about you. He knows you inside and outside. He knows your emotions, your fears. He knows your defeats and your victories. He knows your hurts and your pains and your struggles and your anxieties. And it says in verse 3, you discern my going out and my lying down and are familiar with all of my ways. God knows every one of the patterns of your life. He knows your patterns better than you do. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Sometimes I don't understand myself. I don't know what motivates me or why I have a particular reaction when I have it or what's going wrong inside of me that makes me have an attitude that I shouldn't have. Where did that come from? But the Lord knows it all. He's analyzed it. He can read our minds. He knows our thoughts. He knows even all of the thoughts we've forgotten. He will never forget thoughts that we've already forgotten because he is utterly omniscient. And it goes on to say in verse 5 or in verse 4, before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. Now, there are so many times when I've blurted out something stupid. I just sometimes, have you ever said something? And then you say to yourself, did I just say that? Why did I just say that? What an idiot. I say that about myself sometimes. And the Lord knew in advance I was going to say it. He also knows in advance when I say something that's good. But the Lord's omniscience goes into the future and he anticipates exactly what's going to happen to us. And he goes on to say in verse 5, you hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. In the Living Bible, you both proceed and follow me and lay your hand of blessings on my head. Isn't that wonderful? You both proceed and follow me and lay your hand of blessings on my head. So the psalmist here says, that isn't threatening to me. That isn't frightening. That doesn't make me worry or feel bad. I'm glad about it. Verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. In other words, I am so glad that God understands me because I don't even understand myself. I need someone to understand me. I need someone who really knows who I am. I need someone who can figure out why I'm wired the way that I am and who can help me to improve. And that is you, Lord, he is saying. So I want to reassure you that God knows all about you better than anybody else. Nobody will ever know you the way that he knows you. He knows everything about you, yourself, that you don't even know. And he loves you, the one who knows you best loves you most. And that's why he can help us as we go through life. So that is the omniscience of God. Now, what does your omnipresent God think of you? God and you and God's omnipresence. So that's verses 7 through 12. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heavens, you are there. 
If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not hide from you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. So now the psalmist has gone from talking about God's total knowledge to his total presence. God fills every part of the seen and unseen realms. The Bible says in the book of Colossians that he made all things both seen and unseen. There is a visible world and there's an invisible world. Now, physically, in the sciences, they're still trying to figure out about the hypotheses of invisibility. And the military is working on ways to, to refract light in order to put a shield of invisibility around certain things, and we don't know if they'll ever come about. It's in science fiction. It has been for a long time, and as children, we used to think, or at least I did, that if I closed my eyes real tight, I'd be invisible. But there is an invisible realm. There is an unseen realm that God created, and there are angels and malevolent powers, and maybe they're in this room. There's the eternal city. God himself is invisible. There is this world of the invisible, but God inhabits both the visible and the invisible. There is nowhere that he is not. Now, that's very comforting. That means like the psalmist, you can say, Lord, I can never get away from your Holy Spirit. I can never get away or be lost to my God. And he says, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. I don't know if he was thinking, this is written by David according to the superscription. I don't know if David was thinking of the stellar heavens or the highest heaven where God dwells. But it's interesting, I was reading just this week that when Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, and I remember it, I was a boy, and some of you who are my age, you remember it, and we were watching on black and white televisions. And for the first time ever, a spacecraft with human beings set down on the moon. And we waited, and they had a camera somehow that we could watch. And finally, that hatch opened, and Neil Armstrong stepped out, and he stepped down onto the moon. But what they didn't tell us, and it only came out later, is that before they opened the hatch of that spacecraft, the lunar module, and got out, they did something. They observed the Lord's Supper. Buzz Aldrin, who is a wonderful Christian, had taken elements of bread and wine from his church that his church had given to him. And when they landed on the moon, the first thing that happened with human beings on the surface of the moon was the partaking of the Lord's Supper. If we go up to heaven, He's there. You can never, however far away you travel, you can never get away from the presence of your God. Now, there is a difference between God's presence and his omnipresence. God is everywhere with his pervasive presence, but he can be right here with his personal relational presence. I'll give you an example. God dwelt everywhere in the Arabian desert. Every bush was filled with the presence of God, but there was only one bush where Moses took off his shoes and worshiped in holiness because in a special, relational, personal way, God was in that bush. God is on all of the mountains of this world, always is. He surrounds it, and yet there was only one mountain in the book of Exodus that trembled with fire when the presence of God came down to it. And so while God is everywhere in his pervasive presence, it's wonderful to know that he is with us in his personal presence. And he is here in this room, and it was manifested in an extraordinary way with the person of Jesus Christ. God made flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. And so we have not only the knowledge that God is everywhere, but that God is here and that he is near me. And this is why, you know, my wife is in heaven and I miss her. And, but I don't get lonely. 
I just say, Lord, I'm living here with you. And I've got a lot of friends. I've got family. You've blessed me. But why should I be lonely when you are here? The Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We need human fellowship, but we need fellowship with our Savior more than anything. And he is with you and will never leave you or forsake you. So this is the presence and the omnipresence of God. And he goes on to say in verse number 11, if I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. If someone feels you are in a dark place right now, invite Jesus in. If you feel like there are shadows in your life, say, Lord, bring some sunshine. If you feel gloomy like the weather today, say, Lord, I need a sunbeam. And begin to practice the presence of God. He loves to be near us. And especially when we read our Bible and pray. I mean, when we have our daily devotions, we have a daily appointment with God. We get our cup of coffee or tea and we sit down and we open our Bible and we say, dear Lord, I want to have a conversation. Speak to me. And we read Psalm 139 or Psalm 140. And then we can talk to him in prayer. That fellowship is so wonderful. He walks with us. He talks with us. He tells us we are his own. Amen. And the joy we share as we tarry there, his children have always known. So God is near you. That's the omnipresence of God. Now the psalmist in the next paragraph is going to talk about the omnipotence of God. Omni and potent for powerful. This means that your almighty God loves you and knows you. And we come to this wonderful verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your words are wonderful and I, or your works are wonderful and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Verse 17, how precious are your thoughts to me, God. How vast the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. So this has to do with the creative genius of our almighty God. Every one of us is a walking miracle. Amen. You're a walking miracle the way you're made. The way that God knits us together in our mother's womb. He said to Jeremiah, before you were born, I knew you. And before you ever saw the light of day, I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. This, is, this reality is why we fight so hard for the lives of pre-born children. God loves us even in our womb. It says about John the Baptist, he was filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. And it's the creative genius of God that does that. I had a little great-grandson born about three months ago. And he was born premature, and he was in the neonatal intensive care. I couldn't go and see him because of COVID, but I've been in those units many times, that little, those little children, and they are so wonderfully made and so precious. And I had a doctor once who told me I was not a Christian until I went to medical school and I studied the human hand. And he said, the mechanisms that have to work together in that hand to make everything work correctly is so ingenious. It could never have just evolved. It could never have just come out of nothing. It was designed. It was created. And when he recognized that his hand was created, he recognized, I am created. The whole world is created. We have a God of creation who made us wonderfully, fearfully. That's what God thinks of you. He made you wonderfully and fearfully and in his image. And then we have this verse 16 
And I want to tell you, this verse is as close as I come to having a life verse. It says here in the New International Version, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I gave my life to the Lord for vocational service when I was 19 as a sophomore at Columbia International University. And this is when the Living Bible was just coming out. And I found this psalm in the Living Bible. I'm not the biggest fan of the Living Bible. But when I was 19 and 20, I began studying through Psalm 139 in the Living Bible. And I came to verse 16 and memorized it almost the second I read it. It said, you saw me before I was born and scheduled each day of my life before I began to breathe. Every day was recorded in your book. Now, when you're 19 years old and you suddenly realize that you have a God who has scheduled out every day of your life, it gives you a motivation for living. You know, doing God's will, people say, how do I know what God's will is? How do I find God's will for my life? And the simplest thing is to wake up every morning and say, Lord, what do you want me to do today? God has every day scheduled. And if you take care of the days, he'll take care of the years. And he'll take care of the decades. But we say, Lord, I am yours today. And I know you've got someone for me to see or someone for me to encourage or some work for me to do or some word for me to write or some errand for me to perform. What do you want me to do today? And as you just do day by day, as best you know how, what God wants you to do, then he'll lead the days into the months and the months into the years, and his will for your life will unfold. But every morning, just make it your prayer, Lord, what do you want me to do today? This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I will do your work today. I must be about my father's business. And it's because the Lord designed us. He gave you the personality that you have. He gave you the body you have. None of us have perfect bodies or perfect personalities. But he gave you the gifts and the strengths and the weaknesses that you have. There is nobody in this universe like you. You are his unique creation. And he has a unique work for us to do. And it says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So that's God's omnipotence and us. And notice verse 18 before I go to the last point. It says, How precious are your thoughts, God. How vast the sums of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. But notice, when I awake, I am still with you. In other words, the psalmist is saying, Dear Lord, I cannot imagine how many times you think about me. In fact, the number of thoughts that you have about me is greater than the number of all of the grains of sand on all of the beaches and shorelines of all of the oceans and the seas and the world, and that's just while I'm sleeping. You think about me all while I am sleeping, and when I wake up, you are still thinking about me. Now, this is what I think he was saying. You see why Psalm 139 is so wonderful? You can build a self-image on it because your omniscient God loves you. And your omnipresent God loves you. And your omnipotent God loves you. And finally, our omni-righteous God loves you. Now, there is a real shift here, and it throws some people off. But just look at this with me. Verse 19. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty, they speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do not I hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them as my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. This gives us real insight, the occasion for why David wrote this letter. Why was it that he composed this psalm? What was it that prompted him to get this perspective? 
because there were people in his life causing him trouble. And they were not doing the righteous work that David needed to have done in his life. These were people who were in rebellion against God. There was evil taking place. Behind it all was the devil. And they were causing him a good deal of anxiety. Has anyone ever caused you anxiety? Most of our anxiety in life is caused by other people. And many of them, people that we love, we're burdened for them, we're concerned for them. But for whatever reason, they cause us anxiety. And sometimes there are people who are adversaries of ours and they take us to court or they in some way malign us or they spread rumors about us or they get us fired or whatever it is. We have all of these people and behind all of the evil coming against us is Satan. We have an enemy. The Bible says our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the principalities and the powers and the spiritual forces of darkness in this world. And one day, Jesus Christ is going to be done with all of them. He's going to get them out of the way. He is all righteous. And David was saying, Lord, deal with them and help me, Lord, because I am anxious about these things. Lord, you know my anxious thoughts. So lead me and help me in the way everlasting. And he ends here with this prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there is any offensive way in me. Lord, I'm upset at all of these people. I'm upset at this person that I'm concerned about and this person that's causing me anxiety. But Lord, maybe there is something in me that's causing somebody else anxiety. Maybe I am worrying someone else, or maybe I am grieving the Holy Spirit by something in my life. Will you please see if there is anything that needs to be corrected in my life, Father, if there is anything hindering the fullness of the Holy Spirit in my life, then show me. Help me to deal with it and lead me in the way everlasting. We need that prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my ways. Because so often there may be something in our lives blocking the blessing of God and we don't even recognize it. And we need to say, Lord, show me what it is and help me to deal with it. And God is all righteous. He is all holy. He is omni-righteous. And he loves to come into our lives by his Holy Spirit and help us grow in personal holiness. And I'll tell you, it takes some courage to pray this prayer. It's very nice to get down through these wonderful verses in the psalm leading up to the closing prayer. But it's a little scary to pray that final prayer. When was the last time you offered that prayer? Recently, I've gotten up my courage And I've said, Lord, if there's anything hindering the work of the Holy Spirit in my life, then show me what it is. That's scary to pray. But it's a biblical prayer. That's what David taught us here to pray. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, test me, and know my ways. And show me if there is anything offensive to you in my life. And lead me in the way everlasting. Now, all that is said here about God is true for Jesus. In fact, Jesus is the greatest manifestation of all of this for us. So what does Jesus think of you? Well, he is a wonderful, wonderful, omniscient God. Jesus knew about people the second he saw them. I mean, the moment they walked into the room, he instantly could read them like a book. He knew their thoughts. He knew everything about them. He already did. He always will. He knows you that way. And the one who knows you best loves you most. And he is our omnipresent God. By the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus is here right now. He said, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And he is our omnipotent God. He can do in your life what nobody else can. If you need some renovation, some reconstruction in your life, Jesus alone can do it. 
And if you never ask him to come into your life and be your savior, then you're missing a tremendous blessing because he comes in with all of his grace and all of his love and he transforms us. And the Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, and he is our omni-righteous king because there was never found any sin in him. And no one loves you like he does. You know, one of the songs that I love, there's a lot of songs that I love, but one we used to sing when I was growing up, and it was written by Charles Weigel. He was a traveling evangelist back in the 1920s and 30s. You know, there were so many of these traveling evangelists, and some of them were, they would sing, and they would preach, and they'd go from church to church and city to city. And when I was growing up, we had weekly, or we had a one-week revival every spring and every fall, and a lot of times it was one of these traveling evangelists. So Charles Weigel did that. And he had a wife who just couldn't deal with that life of traveling. And one day he got back exhausted from an evangelistic tour, and he came home and wanted to see her. There was a note, and she said, Charlie, I can't take this life anymore. I've been a fool to stay with you this long, and she was gone. And it broke his heart, and it took him a few years to begin to recognize the very things we've been talking about tonight, how God loves us and he heals us and he helps us. But out of that experience, he wrote this song that says, I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus, how I found in him a friend so kind and true. I would tell you how he saved my life completely. He did something that nobody else could do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. And that's Psalm 139. No one ever cares for you like Jesus. If you don't know him as your Savior, then right where you are in this room, or if you're watching online, you can simply by faith pray and say, dear God, I know that there are things about me that I don't even understand, but I believe that you know me better than anybody and you love me more than anybody. And you sent the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross at Calvary and shed his blood and rose again in order to give me eternal life. And my value to you is seen through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And I now proclaim him the Lord of my life. You pray that prayer, and Christ will come in, and he'll begin to help you establish a self-esteem based on what God thinks of you. And if you are a believer, then don't be afraid to remember these qualities of God and how they intersect so personally with your life, and how important it is to learn to pray with courage and faith Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. Try me and know my ways and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the path of everlasting life. No one ever cared for you. No one will ever care for you like Jesus. Will you bow your heads in prayer? Our Almighty God, we thank you so much for your qualities that are beyond our understanding, for your omniscience, your omnipresence, your omnipotence, and for the righteousness and holiness that brings purity into our lives. Lord, if there is someone here in this room and they need the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, or watching online, Lord, before they go to bed tonight, May they become a new person in Christ. Lord, we ask you to do this. And if there are those here who need to rebuild a sense of self-confidence based upon your love for them, then help them to keep going back to this Psalm 139 over and over again until they are just filled with the truths 
about how you are filled with your love for us. And now, Father, we ask that the Lord would bless us and keep us, that he would make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us, that he would lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. And you're dismissed.